So question 22, and we've covered this question in the past, but I'll, I'll be more specific about the mathematics so you guys can see it, is the first thing I want to pay attention to whenever I have one of these types of questions is the fact that if I'm given an equation up top, but yet there's no actual sort of numbers here, a lot of it's going to be interpretation. The second is I, one of the variables are, is an actual exponent, which is sort of like exponential form. So I need to sort of come to understand, okay, what it is that they're asking, you know, uh, theoretically, like, could it be exponential form? So it says the function w gives the estimated weight wL, which is always my output, or in this case, my y, in pounds of a rainbow trout based on its length in inches. Which of the following is the best interpretation of the number 1.22 in this context? So whenever, uh, my other quick tip is that whenever I have something usually with a decimal here, that is usually connected to a percentage in some aspects. Because let's say, for instance, I have a 22% increase right then it will be written as 1.22 because i'm not only multiplying by the 100 percent of the previous but i'm also taking into account the 22 percent increase now i'm assuming and because of the fact that it's connected to the l and this is me before i go into my answer choices but mathematically like i said i'll, I'll break things down um more for you in detail but i'm assuming that the the 0.22 because it's connected to the l means that every single time length grows, right? Every single time my length grows, I will have a 22% increase for the overall weight, right? Because, because this value times the 0 0.04, which is probably like my initial, right? 0 0.04 is probably what the initial um, length is of, of whatever it is before, before you start adding inches. Um, that will impact the overall weight of the, of the fish or of the trap, right? because the, just the way that the units are, are working out. But, okay, so mathematically, let's see if we can break this down, okay? So here, let's see if we can set up, let's, let's cross this out so you guys don't need that. Okay, so here, here's what I have. I have WL, and here I have 0 0.04, and I have 1.22, and here I have L, okay? Now, some of you would choose, and remember what the question is asking is, it's saying for each increase of one pound in weight or for inch, each increase in one pound of length, okay? So it's asking you what happens if you increase W by one or if you increase L by one? But because I'm leaning more on L, I'm gonna test L, right? So I'm gonna say, and I'm not gonna choose one, two, and three, okay? Just to, just to be fair, I'm gonna choose 10, I'm gonna choose 11, I'm gonna choose 12. And the reason is because I don't want this to just be one, right? I want the differences to be, to be greater, or I guess high enough to sort of see the difference between them. Um, and one may, one or exponent wise may not be higher. So it may actually be the same thing, okay? Anyway, no, neither here nor there. You can do one, two, and three if you, if you want to, but I, because the, I want the number to be high enough, I'm choosing a different value. So I'm gonna do this, but I'm gonna plug in a 10 here. So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do 0 0.04, okay, 1.22 times to the 10th power. And then I'm gonna do it again, 0 0.04, 1.22 to the 11th power. And then I'm gonna do 0 0.04, and I'm gonna do 1.22 to the 12th power. Now, why am I choosing this strategy? Well, because of the wording, because of my understanding of units, and yay, because I get to use a calculator, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's the whole idea. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this, right, in a non-calculator section. I'd be trying to break it down more, uh, I would say more conceptually. So here I want to do 1.22, and I want to do to the 10th power, and now I want to multiply this by 0 0.04. Okay, so here what I get for my output is uh, 0 0.2923, and now I want to do 1.22, and I'm gonna do it to the 11th power, and now I'm gonna also multiply this by 0 0.04, yep, and I get 0 0.35, I'm gonna do 65. Notice I'm going to the, right, the, to the fourth decimal every time, just to sort of make them somewhat accurate. So 0 0.0, hold up, uh, 1.22, and we're gonna do it to the 12th power, and now times 0 0.04 again, and here we are. Now, one thing I do like, I like the fact that the numbers are increasing, right? Because of the fact that I'm 
leaning to the idea that these are all going to be a 22% increase, right? That's the idea. If I go back to the, the verbiage of what I see here, right? I'm, I'm leaning toward the idea that for each increase in one pound, or no, I'm leaning towards B, right? Leaning towards that for each increase in one pound in length, right, the estimated weight of the trout in pounds increased by 22%. Well, how do I prove that mathematically? Is now I want to take this number here, right, which is, and I'll put it in a different color for you. I'm going to take 0 0.2923, and now I'm going to add do a 22% increase. I'm going to take 1.22, right? This accounts for my 22% increase. This accounts for my 100% of my initial, and I'm going to do 0.2923 times 1.22. And what I should get when I hit this equal sign is this number here. I should get 0.35 Six, five, or something like within that range, something really close. And I do, I get 0 0.3566, right? 661 to be exact. So, so that means that if I do a 22% increase, right, in terms of, that means that for every, every time I add one inch in terms of length, right, that I will have a 22% increase overall in terms of net weight, right? Because this equals, 0 0.3566, which is close enough, right, for me to make a make an accurate assessment that this is. So if you don't understand it conceptually, my advice is plug in numbers, right? Plug it and choose numbers like uh, that that make the most sense uh, in terms of arithmetic. I didn't choose one because I didn't I, I didn't know for sure if it was going to be a high enough number. So I chose numbers where I could potentially see a greater greater difference. And because sometimes when you do an exponent to the first power, it can get a little fuzzy, right? So I. I purposely chose numbers that would be a little bit greater, that way you might be able to see like more of a difference. Um, also, depending on your calculator, right? Some calculators can go to like high enough points, others can't, right? So that, that's essentially the reason why I chose uh, 10, 11, and 12, right? I want to see a great enough difference because I knew I was multiplying by 0.04, right? And I guarantee you that if you do 0 0.3565 times 1.22, right, a 22% increase here, I guarantee you, you will get something within this range, which you do. Okay, so my answer is B, because every inch you add in terms of the length here, right, is actually going to increase the overall rate by 22%. So I hope conceptually you understand the question a little bit better, but I also hope you understand the question better just overall um, and mathematically if you ever did need to sort of like plug in numbers. Okay, all right, and finally, to finish up, question number 23. We, here it says, in the given figure, theta is an angle. If sine of theta, right, looks like this, what is cosine of theta? Okay, now, this is referring to the unit circle. My quick hint that I have a unit circle is that all of my radius are one, right? If I went down here, this would be to one. If I went over here, this is to one. Notice this is the y value, this is the x value, so all of these are to one. So really, and because of the fact that I'm referring to sine and cosine. So quick crash course of unit circle, because they usually don't make you memorize everything, um, corresponding to the, to the SAT. But if we need to, let's pull this up here. I'll make this bigger for you guys so you guys can see it. See all of you guys are still tuning in. So please let me know if you have any follow-up questions for the problems that we've done this fall, okay? And uh, we'll most likely end with this problem, but if you want me to cover other problems in the future, or if you just simply want to kind of contact me and like, hey, Mr. Rockoff couldn't figure out this particular problem, well, let me know. Uh, you guys have had really good questions, and, uh, and just let me know if there's anything more that I can do for you, okay? So I'm gonna get rid of this, because we don't need that, okay. Now, in terms of general unit circle, now I'm gonna be fair, most SAT questions involving the unit circle are usually not memorization. To be, to be fair. Most SAT questions involving the unit circle usually involve radians, and they usually involve converting radians to degrees or solving for degrees within a circle and then converting it to uh, radians in some aspects, right? Most of them involve pi. This is one of the very few questions I've ever seen on the SAT that literally just requires memorization of, hey, do you know what the unit circle is? And this is also a very, very few question on the SAT that I've ever seen where you can just use your calculator in order to actually solve for the question involving unit circle. Most of the time you have to know circles or you have to know some sort of like a special right triangle or something that works. With all that being said, here's what the unit circle is. The unit circle is based upon like Cartesian uh, coordinates. 
Notice that these are all my radius here of one, one, negative one, and zero, negative one, okay? The, the radian is simply just specified as a unit of the circle, right, that corresponds to uh, a specific type of degree that you have inside of it, okay? And this also correlates to special right triangles. When you start getting into like your 30, 60, 90, and write your, your radical three or your two, et cetera. But here's what you wanna pay attention to. The cosine and the sine actually represents the X and the Y. So this says if sine of this here is uh, radical three over two, then notice, and then it says what is cosine of theta? So this is the angle that they're referring to. Because this is the angle that they're referring to here, being the 90 degrees, then see if this actually equals your sine, right? So you can even plug this in your calculator. So if this is sine, right, that, that ends up giving you your radical three over two, which is like the point such and such, right, as you actually plug it in, then what you'll notice is on this over here, that's your cosine of that specific. So if this is your angle, right? Basically, if, if what we're suggesting um, is that if sine of 120 degrees equals radical three over two, it just wants to know what is cosine of 120 degrees, okay? And this, in this case, is gonna be negative one half. And where did I find this information? Right here, right? That's, right? So that's, I'm basically either, I'm memorizing it um, in terms of the, the way that it's set up in terms of my X and my Y coordinates for my unit circle, or I'm simply just plugging in my calculator where I know that if sine of one, 120 equals radical three over two, then cosine of 120. And, and at the same time, also notice this. This is this here, right, is, is a positive radical three over two, right? And this is also a positive radical three over two. But your hint is sort of try to understand when you're changing, right, when you're on the op when you're on the other side of 90 degrees, these all then become negative therefore, right? So this is zero, this is positive one half, this is negative one half, this is radical two over two, this is negative radical two over two, this is radical three over two, and this is negative radical three over two. So notice all of these are negative, right, in, within this particular quadrant. So that's just something you wanna pay attention to. And the, the position of the angle is supposed to be your hint of where that is. I do hope that if you get stuck with this, you, you, you do your best to try to like plug these in to make it a little bit easier on yourself. But in a very, very simplified way, the fastest way to do this problem is to quickly recognize where this is, quickly recognize where the unit circle is going to be, simply try to locate kind of what this is going to be estimated to, and let's, I hope you recognize that, hey, this is probably going to be like 135 or 120. I hope that you plug in, you know, sine of 120, which then you then plug in cosine of 120, and when you plug in cosine of 120, you very quickly get which C, which is negative one half, and that is if you just somehow forget that it's, you know, the, the memorization of those things. So I hope that's, uh, like that, that kind of does you a favor in terms of what to look for. But if you're not totally familiar with unit circle, don't stress. You might get one question on it uh, regarding the entire SAT. And more importantly, very rarely do you get a question where you actually have to memorize the, uh, the components of the unit circle. And even in this case, you can just plug it in your calculator, sort of test and evaluate for what it is, okay? So trust in yourself, trust in the strategies. You're gonna do <laughs> just fine. 24 through 27, as much as possible. Okay, so for question 24, I'm skipping all of this information in the beginning because it's a lot and I don't need it. I need to sort of need to know what I'm gonna decipher first. Uh, it says the two-way table categorizes the change in the value of July and August for 50 stocks. If one of the stocks had increased in value in August, so, and then it says probability. Okay, so I'm gonna go back up and I'm gonna read this more closely. And the reason is, because the moment they, they, they say probability, what I now need to identify is what is gonna be my numerator and what is gonna be my denominator. And my numerator, and when we're referring to probability, we're talking about the, the number of, of desired over the number of possible outcomes, okay? So I'm basically figuring out what is the, what is the number desired, like the selected amount, over the total number of possible outcomes of, of what they can show. And most of the time, if students get this wrong, to be fair, it's because they get the denominator wrong. But ironically, it's actually easiest to find if you sort of read it uh, well enough and if it sort of makes sense to you. 
So it says if one of the stocks that increased in value in August is chosen at random, so that is my denominator, okay? If one of the stocks that increased in value in August is chosen at random, right? And the word random is always leading to the fact that you're probably gonna be solving probably. So this is my, my total pool of stocks, right? If one of the stocks in August, so I don't even care about decreased in August because I care about increased in August. Okay, so here's my increased in August, right? These two stocks here, which is a total of 30. It then says if one of the stocks had increased in value in August, it shows in a random. So increased in August, here's 29. It says, what is the property of the stock also increased in value in July? So that's my numerator. So I want to know it increased in July, but it also increased in August, which is this which means it's 21 out of 30. And if I do, if I divide that, I believe you get 0 0.7, right? Out of this, if I divide both by, yep. I, so if I plug this into my calculator here, right? So I think the answer is gonna be C, but if I do 21 divided by 30 here, and I should get, I should get 0.7 for my answer. Minota drove 390 miles. Part of the driving was along local roads where his average speed was 20 miles per hour, and the rest along a highway where his average speed was 60 miles per hour. Right? Immediately, when they're giving you two different rates, okay, that's what this is, then what you care about are the units. And okay? that's always what you want to pay attention to and as they're giving you these things. And that's because when you set up two systems of equations, right, whenever you have like two equal signs, like two amounts, so I guarantee you they're gonna give me another thing, right? So the drive took eight hours, yeah, it's okay. So here's my one unit is eight. So we'll do that one more time. Okay, so here's three, nine, zero. There we go. And now notice, notice this. Some of you, and I think, I'm gonna be fair, I actually think that for the students that had taken the recent March test, I think this was like one of the most commonly missed questions. And it's a tough question because you're thinking to yourself, how do I arrange this? It's not a standard systems of equations problem because there's, I think there's a trick to this problem. And the trick is this, if you understand the rate being in the form of a unit conversion, then you need to know that the rate here is actually gonna be connected to this equation and not this equation. What do I mean by that? Okay, so let me walk you through. This is 20 miles per hour. So I'm gonna do, and because of the fact that it says miles, per hour, but check this out, <laughs> because hours here are in the numerator, but here they're in the denominator. So I could have just as readily said this. I could have just as readily said, and I, I hope you guys get something out of this because every once in a while they'll hit you with this type of question. I could have just as easily said that, hey, for every one hour, I will drive 20 miles, right? I could have done it this way as well. Right? I don't have to say 20 miles per hour. I can say for every one hour, I will drive 20 miles. So that means that the re because why am I setting it up this way? Well, because my hours here are going to be also in my numerator. And that's the reason why. So here, if I set it up where it goes one hour, right, over 20 miles, right, now I'm going to probably, and let's see, let's continue reading the rest of the problem to see what it is they want. The drive took eight hours. What distance in miles am I going to drive along the roads? Okay, so here, here's the other tricky part, is that I have to, and this is probably the easiest part for many of you, is that the 390 miles are x plus y, okay? And so I have to define, okay, which one do I want to be local and which one do I want to be, um, and, and, and which one do I want to be like, like the rest of the, the highway, right? So the local miles, let's just make X, okay? And the here, let's make the highway miles for the Y. So X is gonna represent the amount of local miles that he drove, and Y is gonna represent the amount of highway miles that he drove. And together, it's a total mile mileage of 390 miles. So X and Y will both be in miles, okay? That's a, that's a huge thing, X and Y will both be in miles. So now look at this. So one hour for 20 miles per hour, right? Or one hour for every 20 miles, he drove X miles. 
let me get rid of this for you, right, to sort of set this up. And I'll, I'll organize this in a, in, a, in a better fashion so you guys can see it. But look at this. Look what will happen to my miles as I multiply. So he drove a certain amount of X miles per, like, right, 20 miles per hour. And then the miles will cross out. I will stay in hours, which goes back to my equation being in the numerator. So I'm setting this up in the appropriate way. So now he also, right, he also drove another rate, which was, right, he took the 60 miles per hour or one hour per 60 miles for the long roads, right? So one hour per 60 miles. And here I'm going to do Y miles. Right, if I'm referring to my long roads, and it says what distance miles is drive drawn on local roads. Okay, so I'm also going to come back and circle this. Right, how many miles did you drive on local roads? What does local roads represent? What does the distance of local roads represent? That's, that represents x. Right, the distance along highway road, highway miles that he drove uh, is representing y. So we want to know. What is the distance that he drove along local roads specifically referring to X because he went at this rate, which is how I know that that's also connected to X, which these are our two equations of what we have set. Okay, so I'm going to, let's flip this so that way we can see it. So here I have 390 equals X plus Y. Now I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna write all of the units down, I'll, but the, the units were sort of to help you understand kind of how to appropriately set up a problem. And this here is gonna be eight, which remember this is an eight hours equals one over 20, right? And this is, and if you want, you can put hour here and you can put miles here, right? Times X miles, right? And then this is plus, and I'm going to do, once again, one hour, right? That's his, his rate per 60 miles. And this is Y miles, right? The amount of time that he drove. And I want to I go back real fast just to make sure I am solving for local roads. Yep. Okay. So solving for local roads, which means that I want to solve for X, which means I want to eliminate Y. Now, the, the, the first thing you probably want to do to make this easier on yourself is I'm probably gonna simplify some of this, right? Just to clean it up a little bit to make it easier. So that way what you end up getting is eight equals one over 20 X, okay? Plus one over 60 Y, okay? Now I want to have a common, did not, like I wanna get rid of the fractions, right? So now, now I'm in normal kind of uh, mathematical terms of software X, right? That's really what I want to do. Like I've, I've set up my equations here, right? That's SAT interpretation. Now I want to sort of get this uh, to what it needs to be. So I want to take this entire expression here and I want to multiply by 60. Now why 60? Because if I take 60 and if I distribute it to each of these, right? I will actually get rid of my highest denominator and that's the point. So 60 times one is 60 right? Over 60 is one, then I get one Y. And that's, that's the goal. And, and, the, and here's the nice thing. I want to solve for X. So if I want to eliminate Y, right, I want to get a common multiple. Well, if I multiply by 60, I get one Y and I'll get one Y and then I can just subtract the equations and I'm, and I'm gold, right? And then I'll get number of local miles with it. So I'm going to erase the middle part so you guys can sort of see the, and I'll, and I'll stack the equations together, okay? I'm going to bring the, this top equation here, and I'm just going to bring this whole equation up. So 60 times 8 is 480. Uh, 60 times 1 is 60, right? Divided by 20 is uh, 3, right? So I should get 3x and then plus, uh, so 6, yep, so 3x plus, and then this should be 1y. Okay, now I'm going to delete the bottom part because now I'm sort of set up. And okay, so now I want to get rid of y, right? So I'm just going to subtract these equations and this should give me a, right, x minus 3x is minus 2x, y minus um, y, this will give me zero. So that's the whole reason I'm doing elimination. And then this gives me 390 minus 480, which I want to say is negative 90, but I don't want to make a rookie mistake. 
Uh, so 390 minus 480. And yep, so negative 90. So if I have, um, now I'm going to divide both sides by negative 2. Divide this side by negative 2. So I should get 45 equals x, which is the amount of time that he drives in local miles. So super, like, uh, I would say a lot of layers to this question. Not only do you have to be able to interpret the problem, which uh, put the units, right, understand what it, what it is that they're asking, um, but you need to be really prepared to just do the mathematics of the system's equations, right? So it's, it's kind of both. So 25 is going to be B, yeah. And the fact that the answer is there well, leads me to the idea that we did it the right way, okay? All right, so let's go to 26. Okay, in the quadratic equation above, B is a constant for what values of B does the equation have only one solution? Well, there's different ways to do this problem. Um, a lot of people who like to do these types of problems in their head um, will generally use the discriminant method, uh, which, uh, but I will also say this, that, so, okay, so the discriminant is this. Whenever you say has only one solution or no solutions, or that, that means that the discriminant, which is B squared, minus 4ac, which is what, this is the, the term that falls under the radical in the quadratic formula, right? So you'll, you'll have your quadratic formula, and this is the term that falls here, right? Where it says only have one solution, then it will be a certain output. Well, I personally, uh, um, because of graphing coordinates and factors and such, I generally like to refer to this as what term can you put in right, in order to factor this, in order to get this to be zero. And I'm, I'm leaning towards factoring because of the way that it's set up in a quadratic. Now, the other trick is B could actually be negative. So don't overthink, right, it says what value of B does the equation have only one solution? Because I want to get this to basically be a perfect square, right? Because if they say one solution, it means that it is because it, it will end, end up coming out to be something like this, right? Where I will get something squared equals zero. Okay. So working back, what two numbers, right? When when multiplied together will give you positive 16. Well, you can get a, I would say a positive four, right? Like this. Um, because these are this is also a positive 16, right? So you need a positive 16, so you could do this. Okay. But you also, in order to get a positive 16, you could do a negative 4 and a negative 4, okay? And the it says what value of B. So if B could be negative, and if I fill this in here, well, either being a negative 4 here, right, then, or I'm sorry, that, that wouldn't be a negative 4. But if, if this is a negative 4 and a negative 4, a positive 4 and a positive 4, it's asking for what is the middle term. Right? What is the middle term between these? So it could be x and x like this, or x and x like this in terms of my two factors, which means my middle term are going to be these numbers added together. So it's going to be negative 8 and positive 8. You could also go the discriminant way if you want to, as I'm, as I'm referring to. Um, I personally would, would probably end up doing it the, the factor way because I can do more in my head and I don't have to remember all the discriminant rules and sort of like put them down. Uh, it's less writing, don't have to do any square roots or anything. Um, but if basically, what if we were to factor these relatively quickly, right, for the top one and the, and the bottom one, then what I would get, just so you guys understand where the positive four and the negative four are coming from, or the negative eight and positive eight, I get, if I do the top one here, I will get x squared plus 4x plus 4x plus 16. These combine to form a positive 8x, which in this case is b. Um, and then if I do the bottom one here, I would end up getting x squared minus 4x minus 4x, which gives me a negative 8 when I combine negative 8 x and then positive 16, right? So because b could be positive or negative in this instance, then, then d is going to be my best answer choice, okay? So I have only, yeah, for what value? And then these are obviously taking into account with the, with the actual factors, okay? Awesome. For question 27, it says the function f is defined for all real numbers in the graph of y equals f of x in the xy plane is a line with a negative slope. And it says for which of the following must be true. Now, whenever you get this type of question, a lot of times it's really going to be conceptual. But you, I would encourage you to plug in numbers and graph if you don't see it. And, 
And what I mean by that is that what you need to kind of quickly recognize is that this is the condition that they're giving you. It has to have a negative slope, right? That's my condition, which means what in terms of my X and my Y, right? If this is my X, this is my Y. If I have a negative slope, it means my Y is going to be greater than my X, essentially. And that's, the, that's, a, that's really all I know um, at that point. It says the function f is defined for all real numbers, which means I'm not using right, uh, decimals and such. Uh, it means I'm not using imaginary numbers. My function. And the, the graph of y goes f of x, and it says plain like so, which is fine, which is true. So if it says if a is less than b, and I guess a and b are just relative numbers that you can choose, right? If you need to um, plug in for any reason at all, like if you need to test these, you're welcome to. Um, and then it says f of a is greater than f of b. Well, this will be true. Because this is saying that, let's pretend this is x, right? Because whenever I have f of a of something, this is really referring to y, which means my a is my x, right? So this will be greater. And then if a is less than 0, then f of a is greater than 0. I don't, I don't always know if that's the case. What I would actually do to encourage you, if you need to really break this down, is I would plug in values that are going to make the most sense to you. Um, and graph them if you can, but I would, I would definitely say that the one that I know for sure, and I can go and sort of uh, look up other answer choices, is actually going to be one. So this is the only one that I know that actually works for sure. Um, and if you guys have any, right, if you need anything in addition, just let me know, okay? All right, so here it says, in the equation above, A and B are positive constants, A does not equal B. How many distinct x-intercepts, okay, so x-intercepts does the graph of the equation. So Whenever I see x-intercept, it means y equals zero, okay? Whenever I see y-intercept, it means x equals zero. So in this case, if y is going to equal zero, what it wants to know is, and also here's what I want to take, take into consideration. Whenever they give you the word distinct, distinct means different, different or unique. So if I have anything that is the same up here, that will not be considered distinct, right? It would only be happening essentially one time. And so you notice here I have an x minus a, right? x minus a. So because of that, this is actually only one distinct value, right? Only one distinct, I would say, factor. But notice this is an x plus b, this is an x minus b. These are different factors, so they will have distinct values. So here I have one, right? Here I have two, here I have three, here I have uh, four. Right in the equation above, a and b are positive constants. How many distinct x-intercepts does the graph of the equation of the xy plane have? And it looks as though four is going to be my answer. Okay, and the reason why it's going to be four is because you, we can make this bx equal to zero. We can make this x minus a is equal to zero. We can make this x plus b is equal to zero, or we can make this x minus b is equal to zero. So these are my four different distinct I would say factors, and therefore then I can solve for my roots in order for them to be distinct values. So four, so 28 will be C, which is one, okay? Moving on. 29 says, so it says here one third and X minus K. So here, okay, this question seems a little funky. And rather than kind of taking everything and sort of plugging and chugging a little bit, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a moment to sort of like just glance down at the question and sort of see what it is that we have um, and that we're essentially working with. Because it says one third of x minus k equals kx. And I notice they don't give me another variable and they're actually not giving me what k is. So most of the time you would hope that they give you what k is that you can sort of factor and, and solve. Um, it's not in a quadratic format, which is no x squared. And it says any given equation k is a constant if the equation has no solution what is the value of k? And th these types of questions, you sort of have to work with like hypothetical rather than plugging and chugging a lot of things. So here, here's what I can solve just to make it easier for you. This is one third x minus one third k, okay? Equals kx. Now, the question is, if I start plugging in values, right? Could I then theoretically solve for a value of x? Right. If I plug in, if I plug in these values for k, like if I make this negative one, but then I also make this negative one over here, right? 
could I then still continue to solve for a value of x? If I can still continue to solve for a value of x, then that is not a possible answer choice, okay? What we want to do is we want to plug in a value where I theoretically cannot continue to still solve uh, for my answer choice of x. I guess what I'm saying is this. If I have like one-third, right? Um, sorry, there shouldn't be a negative there. If I have a one-third here, and if I'm multiplying this, um, so I have one-third x, and then I have minus, and then I'm gonna make this one-third, but I'm gonna make this a zero on purpose, and then this equals zero times x. Now I chose this, I chose this value on purpose, so that way you can see, right? Because this is the fastest like, way that I'm describing it. This would immediately become zero, because anything times zero is zero, and then this would also become zero, right? So then this becomes, one third x equals zero. Well, I can still theoretically solve for a value of x, right, on this side. So this, this could be a solution set, which would not work, right? So zero is not a possible, right, value. I could, um, so it says, if the equation above, what is the value of k, right? But it has no solution. So zero could be a solution if I, if I were to do this, if I took x and if I um, multiplied both sides by the reciprocal like this, Right? This is what I'm referring to. If you can solve for the x by plugging these numbers in, right, then this becomes x equals zero, then it means that if it is a possible solution, then that, then that would not work. Right? You need something that's not going to be a possible solution. And the fastest way of doing this problem, realistically, without going down the rabbit hole of like plugging everything in to see what doesn't work in order to solve for it, um, would actually be noticing that these here, are there's a subtraction sign here but here they're being multiplied and because the fact that there is a subtraction sign here and right there these are both one-thirds right but these are being multiplied it means that it can't be one-third and because because i'm changing the uh the, the mathematical kind of like computation between them right and even if i factor it wouldn't it wouldn't matter so my 29 is, is most likely going to be D. And that's because of the fact that no matter what I do, I, I can't suddenly change this, this, this minus here, right, is then going to suddenly be like a multiplication. And that's the reason why. But if I were to plug in my other values, notice the negative one, anything times, right, one, or, right, it's going to be itself. So that's why I'm probably not leaning towards negative one. Um, and if I were to plug this in for one third, if I needed to double check, then, then I know that I will end up getting right, a, a particular solution. So if the way to do this problem, and really what they're saying is that if you plug in a value for k, right, like in this, in this sense, I plug in either negative one, I plug in zero, or maybe I plug in a negative one third, I will then be able to solve for x, right? But if I can't end up finishing and solving for x, then, right, then that, that, that would be the fastest way, okay? So if you, have, uh, if you have specific questions, I see some of you guys are raising your hand. If you have specific questions, just feel free to put them in the chat, and I'll, and I'll let you know. And I can even go through each one if you want, but time purposes, we're not going to do that. Um, but the, the way that you, you can solve this question if you needed to is, is honestly kind of plug in, plug in the other values. Okay, so question 30 looks as this. It says the expressions x squared plus bx plus 10, okay, and it says and x minus 3 squared plus c. And it says where, a, where B and C are constants are equivalent. Whenever I see this, it just means equal sign. It says, what is the value of B plus C? I want to circle this so I don't make a rookie mistake. Okay, now when it says equivalent and they give you two different expressions, then I just simply want to write out the expressions. And for time purposes, I'm not going to write out all of this. Well, actually, I am going to write out all of this. But what I mean is I'm going to quickly foil it in my head, okay? And the, the quick way of foiling anything in your head is you simply do the first term, you square the first term, you take these, you add them together, right, knowing, and then so this is gonna be minus six x, and you take the last term, you square the last term, right? So this is gonna be uh, positive nine. And then this is plus c. So notice, here's what I have. It says, once it, it wants to know what b plus c is. So my b is located in front of the singular x, right, not the x squared, so here, so b is going to be negative 6, right? This is b. This is negative 6. And then my 9 plus c here is going to be not connected to any sort of x at all. So these things here 
because of the fact that both of these expressions are going to be equivalent, knowing that my x squared and my x squared here are kind of negligent uh, in, this, in this aspect. Then here, if I have 10, right, that means that 10 equals 9 plus c, so c is going to be 1, right? So if, if this, if uh, 9 plus c is going to be 10, then that means that c will equal 1 overall. But I want to make a rookie mistake. This is b plus c. So if b is negative 6 and c is 1, then this is 6 plus 1 should give me negative 5. Let's scan back up. Yep, negative 5 is a possible answer choice, and we are good. Okay, so for question 30, negative 5, d, right, moving on. Um, quick, quick thing as we go through this is that just make sure that whenever they say equivalent, you need to be prepared to kind of set them up, to set them equal to each other. And then you're looking to find the like terms in this instance, right? The moment that you can identify that B is negative six, and that makes it a lot easier to sort of predict where the C comes from and what C has to be related to. And let's go to the following page. So we're going to do questions. It says, what value of X makes the equation true above? In order for us to answer this question, well, we really want to sort of, and, and remember, in terms of the, the general SAT for the open-ended questions, right, when we're discussing the open-ended, what you want to pay attention to is that the questions in the beginning are generally easier than the questions at the end. So this is, 31 is essentially going to be easier than 38. So yeah, bear that in mind in terms of the amount of time, effort, and sort of uh, try not to overthink it, right? Think kind of what's going to be the best strategy of what to do. It says what value of x makes the equation above true? Well, if this is going to be equal to zero, and right, it, it's basically asking what value can I put into this factor here in order to make this equal to zero? And if I make this uh, a positive three, then this becomes positive three minus three. It doesn't matter to the fourth power. That's just, you, that's just there to try to trick you. So the, the answer is going to be x equals 3, right, just in terms of a general root. And you might even see it something like this, where it's x minus 3, right, x minus 3, right, and then x minus 3. So even if they wrote it in this, this uh, style of format, then, and if this equals 0, it's if any one of these, right, which we consider these to be factors, but if any one of these, right, I can set this to be x minus 3 equals 0, then I would just simply carry the three and this would be uh, x equals three. So that's the fastest way to do that problem. But just having a general understanding of what is a factor, what is a root, right? And then if you set them equal to zero, that will, that will help you out in the future, okay? But the, the answer is x equals three. All right, moving on. And it says here, in the data set shown, r is an integer if the median of the data set is eight and r is less than 11. So I wanna circle a keyword here, which is median. And it says, what is a possible value of R? And I'm gonna circle this as well. Now, remember, in terms of just general data sets, the median is the number, it's the middle value of the data set when the numbers are in numerical order, okay? So the middle value when the numbers are in numerical order. So when the numbers are in numerical order. And uh, basically highest or lowest to highest. So I want to put these in lowest to highest because that would be my first mistake. And generally, if students get a median question wrong, it's because they forget this part, right? They want to put things in numeric order to make it easier for them. So I want to actually take these and I'm going to put them in numeric order. And then it says, what is a possible value? And the, and the fact that it's saying a possible value is signifying to me that it's possible to have more than one answer, right? So this means multiple answers and I want to be aware that if there are multiple answers, I probably want to choose the most obvious answer and sort of like what, what's going to make the most sense. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this so that way we understand what the basics of the median is. And now I'm going to line up these values uh, lowest to highest, okay? And it looks like four is going to be my lowest. Then I have five. Then I have another five. And, and it looks as though there's a set of eight. So I want to pay attention to that as well because it's the full total. Um, and so I have four, five, five, now I have eight. Uh, now it looks like, and you know what, I'm gonna put R here on purpose and you'll see why. And then I will have, it looks like 11 and then 13, right? So I'm not missing anything, right? And then 11 and then 13, 11, 
five, five, eight, R. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Now the question is, the question is asking this, is that if R is less than 11, right? What is a possible value of R? And it says if the median of the value of the data set, R is an integer if the median of the data set is eight. Okay. So the, this is the trick. The median is eight, right? So if the median is eight, that means that this is the middle. And if this is the middle, given the fact that if I have like eight values going across, and I'll just, I'll just number them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that means that the, between the fourth and the fifth, right, between these two, right, if the median of the data set is eight and R is what is the possible value of R, and that means that here out of my eight values will be my, will be my, my median, right, between the fourth and the fifth value. But if, if I'm adding another here, like let's pretend I have nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, then my median here is gonna be my fifth value when I, when I add them, right? Or I put them all lowest to highest. So without overthinking this too much, basically what, what they're instructing you is that the middle value here needs to be less than 11, but it really could be, let's say, 8, 9, 10, or because of the fact that it can, it can sort of be anything in between here, right? Because if I add, here's 4, 5, 5, 8, and I'll, I'll make this an 8 on purpose, and then if I do, and now this is my R, then 11, right, and, and, uh, and uh, 13, Right, if the, ours, if the median of the value is set, and then it was ours less than 11, what's possible value of R? Because look what happens here. This, this would make this, right, be eight. So I'm gonna choose eight as my answer, but I could also choose other things that are gonna be less than 11, right? So eight, nine, and 10 are realistically gonna be the possible answer choices. But I'm gonna choose eight because that's gonna be the best answer in order to keep this sort of uniform, right? Okay, so let's go up to question 32. And once again, if you, have, if you ever have like, uh, ask for more clarity, just feel free to drop it in the chat function and I'll, I'd be happy to sort of uh, discuss it in a little bit more detail. Okay, and here we are for question, question 33. Okay, so question 33, immediately I see stacked equations. This tells me they are going to be standard systems of equations um, and it even says systems of equations, right, as I'm outlining this. It says if x, uh, if the x, y is the solution to this equation above was the value of x, because of the fact that they're telling me what they want me to find specifically, um, what you want to pay attention to, most likely you will use what is called the elimination method because they are telling me what I want to find and because of the fact that here I actually have numbers in front of my x's, right? Even though I don't have numbers in front of my y's, usually when I have numbers in front of the x or the y, if I do substitution, I have to bear in mind that I'm then going to have fractions when I go to plug them into the next set, which I, I sort of don't want to do, right? That can make it a little more complicated. I'd be happy to show you follow-up videos that sort of suggest that. Um, but in this instance, I want to eliminate Y, right? So I'm going to eliminate Y in order to uh, solve for X, right? So I'm circling the thing that I want to solve for. So that way that will help me sort of guide me to what's the best strategy. So here I have 4X plus y equals four, and then I here I have eight x plus y equals five. Now, when you're doing the elimination method, and this is sort of the, the million dollar kind of strategy, is you need to find the common multiple between the thing that you're eliminating. Now, in this case, I'm gonna try and eliminate y. Well, the common multiple is one in this instance, because I have one y and one y. So this is already set up. If this wasn't one and one, I would have to multiply one of these equations or perhaps both of these equations in order to get the common multiple, right? Like if the top equation was a two y, then I'd have to multiply the bottom equation by two to get a two y. So I could subtract out the equations or subtract out the y's. That's, that is essentially what they're referring to by the elimination method. Um, in this instance, they're already given to me, so it makes it, it, makes it easier, okay? So here I have four x plus one y equals four, and here I have eight x plus one y equals five. I'm gonna subtract out both of these equations and you could have multiplied one equation by negative one if you want to, or you can sort of trust your ability to do uh, subtraction, whatever is easiest for you. So here I have 4x minus 8x, which is gonna be minus 4x. Here I have 1y minus 1y, which is the entire purpose of the reason why I'm doing this, which gives me zero, right? And this is what is referred to as the elimination method. That is the, 
the goal of this of this method. Okay, and then I have four minus five, which is going to end up giving me uh, negative one. So here I have negative four x equals negative one. I want to solve for x by itself, so I'm going to divide both sides by negative four. Right? Don't make the rookie mistake of just assuming that that x is going to be negative four. Right? Make sure to to sort of line up the math and make it easier. And a uh, quick tip is that my answer is going to be one fourth or 0 0.25. But remember, I, I know that this must be positive. And the reason I know this must be positive is because I'm in the open ended section. And if I'm in the open ended section, I cannot have radicals in my answer choices, like the actual radical sign. I cannot have negatives in my answer choices, and I cannot have pi in my answer choices. So this that lends to the idea that I did do this correctly because I do not have a negative and it ends up canceling the negative out. Okay, appropriate. I solve for x, I don't need to solve for y, one fourth is my answer, and I move on. Yay. Okay, so 34. Let's slide on down. Okay, here it looks as though I'm going to make this sort of zoom in a little bit so you guys can see it. Okay. Okay, here it says one serving of a certain brand of microwave popcorn provides 150 calories and 90 of which are from fat. Okay, so I'm gonna circle this and it says one serving of certain brand of low sodium pretzels provides 100 calor 120 calories, 20 of which are from fat. Now, I don't exactly know what they're asking yet, but here's what I can tell you, is that as you're reading through questions and if you sort of wanna become a master of SAT math, you kind of need to start to get in the habit of like, predicting what the concept is most likely going to be. I can tell you because of the fact that they're giving you a 90 over 150 and then and then now they're giving you a 12 over 120. I am leaning towards the idea, once again, don't know exactly what they're going to ask yet, but I'm leaning towards the idea that they're either going to ask something to do with ratios and ratios always kind of fall in line with like proportions. So they're, good of, they're most likely to ask something to do with ratios, proportions, fractions, percentages. It's all kind of like one blend of, of a concept, right? And there's, there's different, uh, uh, there's slight nuances between, between each one. But essentially, you need to know sort of how to combine any of them together. Okay, so here it says 12 of which are from fat. How many more calories from fat are provided by a 100 calorie serving, okay, of the microwave popcorn that are provided by the 100 calorie sour rate of pretzels? Yes, all right, so this is asking you, if I did not have 150 calories, right, or 150 calories from the serving, right, and instead we only ate a proportional amount where they gave you 100, and they gave you 100 for both, they want you to solve what these would be, right? So let's pretend it's not 150 calories in a bag, let's just pretend it's 100 calories for both the pretzels as well as the popcorn, and I need to determine what is the difference. And I'm assuming that this number up top here, the 90 over 150 is gonna be higher than the 12 over 120, right? In terms of like percentage wise. So they wanna know what is the difference between these two numbers when I solve for them. So I'm gonna quickly pull out my calculator, right? Um, even though I'm in the non calculator section, I can probably do this without using calculator, no reason to be a hero. So I'm gonna do 90 times 100, uh, that gives me 9,000, and then I'm going to divide by my 150, right? So here I have one, I cross multiplied, right? 90 times 100, and then now I'm going to divide by 150. So divide by 150, and I'm getting 60, okay? And over here, I'm going to do, this looks like it's going to be 10, right? Because it's a 100 times 12, which is 1,200, and then divide it by 120, okay? And yep, this is 10. And remember, the question is asking you specifically for, let's make sure that we always go back and double check, right? This is how the students get, you know, seven eighties and above <laughs> in, the, in the math section is they don't make a, a careless mistake. The question in this case is specifically asking for how many more calories from fat are provided by 100 calorie serving of popcorn, which is good. This is higher, so we know we're on the right track, uh, that are provided by the 100 calorie serving of pretzels. Yes, so the difference is 60 minus 10, I know crazy that the answer is something as simple as 60 minus 10. But the question is, do you know how to interpret this to know that really they're referring to ratios and proportions? Okay, so the answer is going to be 50 for number 34. All right, let's move on. Question 35. Okay, so in length, in meters of the size of a height and parallelogram, I'm going to circle this, 
Okay. Notice I immediately skip the figure because of the fact that I see here that I have a parallelogram, but I don't know what it is that they're going to ask me for. So I just notice that I have a, I have a specific figure that they're giving me. It says, what is the area? So I want to circle this as well because I need to know what area of a parallelogram is. And I, I don't, I don't know for sure if they actually give this to you. I don't recall um, if they give this to you in the reference section. So I'm going to go and I'm going to scan back uh, quickly just to see. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Most of the time, no. So they don't. Okay. So you have, you have area of a triangle here, right? And you have area of a rectangle or essentially a square. Um, but your area of a parallelogram, I actually think is just base times height. If I, if I recall, Right, if I if I make this easy, and I want to say it, that seems a little bit too easy, and the reason is because if I'm doing base times height, I'm I'm essentially just doing five times ten, right? So base times height, and then I'm not even using um, this number at all, which would seem odd because most of the time on the SAT they always give you things for a reason. It's it's very unlikely that they give you information and you don't use it in some kind of capacity. Uh, so I'm thinking if this is the case, which if I did look at, if, if I go and if I scan the answer uh, key relatively quickly, I think it is 50. So I think, I think the base here would actually, assuming this is referring to the entire base here is 10, right? And the height here is, is the five, right? So I think, I think our answer would be 50. Um, however, I would need to double check when the actual uh, answer key is released because of the fact that, I, because this is the answer key I believe that they have recorded, however, then it means they're not using the 5.25, which in that respect, and, and sort of the key takeaway is, it's a little uncommon for them to do that on the SAT, but something to know. So in this case, the answer would be 50, but I'm gonna go and research it a little bit more just to have a better understanding of if you need the 5.25, okay? Right, so for question 36, okay, question 36, the linear function f is defined by f of x equals cx plus t. Immediately when I read this, I always think of f of x as y. And I always know that this is referred to as an input, meaning that when x is this, y is this, right? Like my, my x, y coordinate, essentially. I also see, and they tell me, it's a linear function. So the moment that they say linear, I immediately think y equals mx plus b. Okay, now notice I haven't even read the question yet, but these are things that I think about as I'm anticipating the question. So that way, as I'm reading the rest of it, I'm, I know exactly what to do, right? Most of these problems I can, I can realistically do in my head. And that's because of the fact that I can anticipate like what, what they're gonna do and how they're gonna use that information. I'm, I'm writing things down to sort of like guide you guys on what to anticipate. Now, here's, here's a Y, here's an X each time, okay? The C is unique and it says where C and D are constants, if f of 50 equals 27,000 and f of 100 equals 38,000, what is the value of c? Exactly. So the reason why I circled m immediately is because most of the time when they give you a linear function and they're giving you coordinates that correspond with the linear function, they will want you to determine slope in some way. And in this case, that's exactly what they're asking you to do. They're asking you to figure out what is slope. So here are my two coordinates, okay, without having to draw like a graph or anything of that nature. It's, this is x equals 50, which means then my y, or my total output, will equal 27,000. And then I know my second coordinate here is when f of 100, right, which means that x equals 100, and then y will equal 38,000. So basically, what, what I have here is I have a slope equation, right? Because if I do my y2 minus my y1, over my x2 minus my x1, I will end up getting my slope, right? Or in this case, c. So if I plug these values in, and I'll, I'll just do the higher numbers as my, my y2 and uh, my x2, and I'm gonna purposely do that so that way I get a positive value because of the fact that I'm in a, an open-ended once again, sort of. Now, I could reverse it and I'll get negatives for both and the negatives will cancel, that's fine. There's no reason to make it harder on myself. So I'm, I'm basically gonna do, 38,000 minus 27,000 here. And when I do 38,000 minus 27,000, right, I'm gonna get 11,000. And then this is gonna be 100 minus 50, okay? Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase a lot of the, the other information. Okay, so that way we can kind of clean this up a little bit. 
here. Okay. And so I'm gonna, I'm basically gonna start to solve this over here, which is 11,000 divided by 50. And right, so I can, I can immediately knock these off if I want to, but I'm gonna plug it in my calculator again, 11,000 divided by 50, and I should get, yep, 220. Okay, I was gonna say, I should get a, a whole number. Um, and one of my hints that I'm actually gonna get a whole number is because of the fact that they don't say what is the best approximation or round to the tenths place. They don't say that information here, so I'm leaning to the idea that I'm gonna get a whole number. 220 is gonna be my answer for number 36. I'm good, happy, <laughs> I hope you guys are good too. And once again, any questions at all for any of these problems, just feel free to drop them in the chat function, okay? All right, we're gonna move on. So going to question 37. Now, it is, it is pretty common practice for the SAT to usually have the last two questions for 37, 38, or 36, 37, 38. It's pretty common practice for them to actually do some sort of graphing and interpretation. So don't be alarmed when you get to them. Uh, to be fair, they're not really tough problems uh, for the most part. It usually, they usually just take more time because there's more things for you to evaluate. So the first tip I will always give you is when you're getting to a graphing problem, the first things you want to pay attention to are the title. It will tell you the overall main idea, which is value of 19 main, uh, mainframe computers. You want to pay attention to the x-axis, which will tell you what is the independent variable. It says age of computer. I want to circle the unit so I can sort of, before I read the question, I have a general idea. And this is like a boom, 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 right? I read the title, I read the x, I read the y, okay? Just to sort of pay attention to. And the y is in thousands of dollars, right? Value of computer, what about, and thousands of dollars. And the rest of this information here, I can read. Uh, when the time comes, um, but I'm going to first sort of get a general idea of what I need to look for, right? So I'm going to go back up to the question. Now. So it's based on the based on the line of best fit, which is remember this line here, the line that's kind of connecting all the dots. It says the estimated value of a six-year-old computer uh, is k thousand dollars. Now notice the unit here, k thousands of dollars, where k is an integer, what is the value of k? Integer meaning whole number, not a decimal, not a fraction. Okay, so here's what I wanna do. I wanna go and I wanna mark off what I know here. It's this estimated value of six-year-old computer, so years here, here's six. So here's what I have. And um, no, now notice where I put the dot. I put it according to the line of best fit, which you see here. And then it says, it is in K thousands of dollars, and I notice that this unit here is in thousands of dollars, so that's happy. Um, it says, what is the value of K? Well, I'm just gonna slide over. It looks like K is gonna be 15, right? So overall, it is $15,000, but it is K thousands of dollars, so my answer should be 15. Not 15,000, but, but 15, because it's already in thousands of dollars, right? According to the way that the question is written. Okay, so 15 is gonna be your answer for question number 37. Now moving on, finishing it up, going to question 38. And notice I'm keeping the, the graph still kind of in vision so you guys can see that. And then this says, what is the number of computers? I'm gonna circle this, because right, what it's asking me to solve for. I also noticed this, here's a, here's a quick tip. Um, here's, the quick tip is this, this is in age, this is in value, there is no number. Okay, <laughs> there's no there's no actual number that's 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 on the on the axis. So if I'm going to assume the number is somehow going to be referring to the 19 or perhaps these number of dots that they're giving. Me, okay, it says what is the number of computers for which the line of best fit predicts a value less than the actual value? Okay, so the line of best fit predicts a value less than, and I want to circle the word less than because this is the biggest this is really the only hint that they're giving you in order to solve the problem. And less than means in a very simplistic way. And I'm also going to skim here so I don't make a, a, a tiny mistake, right? A large company has 19 mainframe computers of a certain class. Scatter plot above shows the value of the age of the 19. Yeah. So it is the number then. So all these dots, each dot is referring to one computer. Okay. So then this brings me to the idea that every single time the line appears below a dot, okay, this means every time the line is below the dot, okay, so line is below the dot, that means that that computer was worth more than the line predicted, 
okay? Because it says, what, what is the number of computers for which the line of best fit predicts a value less than the actual value? So what I care about are the number of dots that are above the line, right? That's, a, that's really, if I, if I sort of had to double check, right? So yeah, so the line, yeah, the line is gonna be beneath the dot, right, in terms of the, value, the, the best value. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so nine should be my answer. The only other way you can really answer this is 10, and that's if you sort of do the reverse of this. But remember, it says here, which, for which the line of the predicts the value uh, predicts a value less than the actual value. The actual value is what they sold for according to the value here. The line is suggesting what they were predicted to sell for, but perhaps didn't sell for, right? If they sold higher than the line of best fit, um, then, then they sold for more. So, okay, so nine is gonna be my answer for question 38. We had already done question 37. So we are finished with the open-ended section. Okay, yay, right? <laughs> okay.